do the first. Oh, it's not here. It's up in my office now. Okay, folks. Welcome back. So I, I kept my promise, right? A whole week without emails. It was really, really difficult for me. Every day I had to restrain myself, turn off the Wi-Fi. No, but um, for those of you who have been reading your emails for the last two days, um, this Friday is your one-time deal, right? If you, it's not required. It's optional. It's not for a grade. It's for feedback. But if you want to send your DCF in, do, it, do so by this Friday. In fact, you don't have to wait till Friday. If you're already done and you want to get your feedback on it, you know, send it as soon as you can. In fact, I don't want to wake up on, or I'll be awake at 5 p.m. on Friday to 800 emails. I'm actually going to be in Warsaw, Poland that day, so I don't even know what time zone I'll be on, to 800 emails coming in because the undergraduate class is also sending in their DCF. So if you can send it early, it's easier for me. I can do the, I have a long flight on Wednesday night, overnight, so if you want the feedback quicker, send it soon. You will usually, if you send it earlier, you'll probably get the feedback within 15 to 30 minutes of sending it to me. If you send it later, I'll, you know, I'll go sequentially down the list. That's the other advantage. You'll get the feedback quicker. I'm trying to get you to get your valuations in as soon as possible. Today, we're actually going to talk about something that I think is essential to doing evaluation. But there are a few loose ends I still want to tie up. And I want to start off today's class with a few, few questions about the remaining loose ends. So here's the first one. Let's say you've done a discounted cash flow valuation of your company. You've taken free cash flow of the firm. You come up with a value for the firm of $100 million. So this is cash flows, discount back at the cost of capital, value of the operating assets. This firm has debt outstanding. That debt has a face value, a book value of $100 million, but the market value of the debt is only $80 million. So my question is a very simple one. You've discounted the cash flows. You come up with a value of $100 million for the firm, it has debt outstanding, book value is 100 million, market value is 80 million. Uh, it should say 200 million, but it should say 20 million. The first choice is there, 20 million. Which of the following is the right value for the equity? Remember, you're supposed to subtract out debt to get to the value of equity? Should I subtract out the book value, in which case the value is nothing? Should I subtract out the market value, in which case the value is 20 million? Or should the answer be somewhere between 0 and 20 million? You see what I'm asking? Should I subtract that market value of debt? Because in cost of capital, what is the rule? Always use market value. There's no exemptions. But now it's a different question you're facing, right? You're trying to come up with an equity value. Should I subtract out the market value or the book value? What do you think? Market. market value. In fact, every textbook will say market value. And it always has made, un made me uncomfortable. And here's why. Why is the market value of debt lower than the book value? Because the company's in some distress, right? So because it's in distress, the market value of the debt has dropped. Let's say I'm an acquirer. I'm a safe acquirer. I am trying to buy this company. You see the danger of my paying $20 million for equity? Because the minute the debt holders learn that I'm trying to acquire this firm, guess what's going to happen to the $80 million in debt? They now know that somebody with deep pockets is coming. The $80 million is going to go back to $100 million my equity value is going to disappear. If you're going to do an acquisition and your debt is going to, your credit standing is now going to replace that of, you very quickly can see the most you should pay for this company is zero because the minute you announce the debt value is going to rise, your equity value is going to go to zero. But if you're an investor, you don't have this power, you're not going to, then in a sense you can make the argument, it should be market value of debt. What makes the market value of debt low is also pushing down the value of the assets to be consistent. I'm going to use market value. So, the right answer is market value, but you can see how you can have exception to the rule when you're doing an acquisition. Let's try a different issue. Let's assume you valued equity in a firm. You've discounted free cash flows equity at the cost of equity. You've done the right thing. You've come up with the value of a billion dollars for the equity. This is the easy one, so don't look for tricks here. You have 100 million shares outstanding. What's the value per share? Come on, I told you there was no trick. Billion, is it weak, kind of melted your brain already? <laughs> Billion divided by 100 million is $10 per share, right? That's the easy part. Now let me load up the problem. Let's assume that this firm now grants 10 million options with a strike price of 10. That's significant because by setting the strike price to 10, what have I essentially made these options? I made them at the money options. So the value per share was 10. I'm issuing the 
options today, essentially with the strike price of 10. I want you to think like an investor in the company. The only thing that's changed, I've issued these extra 10 million options. I want you to tell me what will happen to your value per share. It used to be $10 before I did this. And here are your choices. The first is to take the 100 million and divide by the shares that will be outstanding with the option put. That's called a fully diluted approach. You say, I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to count 110 million shares. The second is to say, well, those options are have an exercise value of nothing. Therefore, they're worth nothing. So my share value did not change. Maybe the answer is somewhere between 9, 0, 9, and 10. Or maybe I'm missing something. Maybe that's be higher than 10. First, how many of you think your value per share will be completely unaffected by my giving away options which are at the money? Anybody here be believe that? You know, for 20 years, accountants asked us to believe that. Because until 2007, here's how accountants dealt with management options. If they were at the money, the accountants said, don't worry about it. It's worth nothing. These guys must have never gone to the Chicago Board of Options and tried to buy. Can you imagine going to the option exchange saying, that's an at-the-money option. I don't pay for them. Give it to me free. You can try, but it's not going to work. We're missing the option premium. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is the delusion that surrounds stock-based compensation. There's a lot of very bad practices around stock-based compensation. We're going to talk about the sloppy ways in which people deal with these options the right way to do it, and why people seem to fight the right way. So let's get back to where we were. We were talking about loose sense and valuation. I think we were towards the very end of the complexity. Slides. Oops. Oh, that's so far. We're talking about complexity. I know it's been a long time. You've probably forgotten the discussion. We're asking whether we should be punishing complex firms for being complex. And for those of you who've started work on your companies, presumably have advanced, you probably notice that some things about your company are messy. Things like breakdown of revenues regionally. That is, of breaking it down in some sensible way. So it's the US and the rest of the world. Breakdown of businesses is fuzzy. And what we concluded was perhaps we should be punishing complex firms for being complex. And I gave you two measures of complexity. Do you remember what they were? This is a simplistic measure where I just counted the number of pages in your 10Q and 10K. Remarkably effective if you ask me. Okay? But people didn't like it. So I gave them this loaded up approach where I said, go through the 10K. I'll give you a complexity score. Either way, I can measure complexity. What I didn't get to, though, was once you measured complexity, what are you going to do about it? Let's take a discounted cash flow valuation. If I want to bring complexity into the equation, here are your choices. You can take your cash flows and haircut them. What does that mean? If you're a complex firm, I'm going to take your expected cash flows and reduce them because I don't know where the cash flows are coming from. I'm feeling uncertain. I can take your discount rate and raise it. And there I can give you some guidance on how to do it. Remember how we computed implied equity risk premiums for the S&P 500? We took the index level and we backed out what rate of return is. When I was looking at complexity, I actually did an experiment. I took the S&P 500 and I broke it up into two halves based on complexity. I had to make some judgment calls. So basically, the companies like GE went in one half and the companies like Walmart went in the other. So I took the 250 complex companies and I computed the implied cost of equity for those companies using the same approach I used for the S&P 500. Then I did the same thing for the non-complex companies. You see what I was trying to find out? Does the market punish complex companies by charging a higher cost of equity? At least at, at the time that I did this, which was in 2007 and 2008, the complex companies had a cost of equity about 1% higher than the non-complex companies. So you're saying, how do I build that into my valuation? You're valuing a complex company. You're going to take risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, and then you're going to add an extra 1%, adjusting the discount rate. So you can adjust the cash flows, adjust the discount rate. But I'll tell you my favorite way of dealing with complexity. Remember when we talked about growth? We said the value of growth comes from what? Earning a return on capital greater than your cost of capital. If you have a complex company where you don't understand where excess returns are coming from, you know they s may seem to make a lot of money, but you have no idea what they do. My suggestion is that the best way you take it out is those excess returns you see today, don't assume they can last for very long, because if you can't tell me what they're built on, 
make them go away. I'll give you my favorite example. In the late 90s, one of the companies people used to pick in this class to value, because they're in the news and everybody's you know, looking at it, was Enron. And to a person, every person, and this was well before we knew about the accounting scams and all the rest of the crap. They would come to me, 96, 97, 98. They'd come to me and say, look, I'm valuing Enron. I can see they're making a lot of money, but I don't know what they do. They call themselves energy traders, but what does that even mean? Who are they buying the energy to? Who are they selling the energy to? Why do they make money from doing this? But they make a lot of money. What should I do? And at that point, I, have no, I had no idea about the this, this stuff going on under the surface. My advice to them was, it is what it is. They're making a lot of money, but here's how I would deal with it. They're making a lot of money. They have a high return. But since I don't know how they're making the money, when I project out that return on capital in the future, I'm going to bring it down very quickly to the cost of capital because it's a great way to smoke management out. When managers are complex, one of the ways you can punish them is say, hey, you don't tell me more about your business. I'm going to make your excess returns go away. Your growth is going to be worthless. You don't like it, tell me more. And if they don't, maybe there is nothing below the complexity. and Maybe you should be scared about whether those excess returns can be maintained. So if you want to bring it into valuation, cash flows, growth, excess returns, three choices, make one and move on. One final throwaway at the end of the, this paper that I did on complexity, remember I was spending a month on each of these topics. I'm getting toward the end of the month. I want to be done with this topic. I do one final study, if you can call it that. I took the 100 largest market cap stocks in the US. I took their price to book ratios, market value divided by book value. And usually when you're trying to explain price to book, there are three variables that use, and we'll talk about why later in this class, return on equity beta and, and, and growth rate. I threw them in. And then just for kicks, I threw in the number of pages in the 10K into the regression. Focus just on the coefficient on the number of pages in the 10K. Minus 0 0.003. How do I read that? What does it tell me? Every 100 additional pages in your 10K knocks down your price to book by 0.3. Let's set up a value enhancement consulting service. Our first client is Citigroup. They come in and say, a price to book ratio is 0.9. This is terrible. I want to double it. Let's give them the advice. To get from 0.9 to 1.8, all you need to do is knock 300 pages off your 1,000 page 10K. Sounds facetious. But it's actually sensible, because if you think about why City is a 1,000-page 10K, it is not by accident. It's by design. They created a financial supermarket that wanted to be all things to all people. And what this regression is saying is you are being punished for being complex. Become simpler. I think if you look at money center banks today, personally, if I would give a dishing art advice to Jamie Dimon, not that he ever takes advice from anybody, my advice to JP Morgan is get ahead of the Volcker rule. Break yourself up. Make it look like you're doing it for the common good. The reality is you're being punished as JP Morgan because people have given up on valuing money center banks. They terrify me because they're, they're opaque. There's so much you don't know. You're better off actually as pieces rather than as a complex whole. There might be good times when people can uh, you know, completely ignore complexity, but people are terrified of complexity now. So as you watch the untangling of the conglomerates, right, the, from the G's of the world down to smaller conglomerates, what you're seeing is companies being punished because they're opaque and, and, and these messy companies to value. Maybe by making yourself simpler. And I dish out the same advice to Sony. Might be a great company, but I can't find it. It's just all over the place. I don't know what you're getting money from. This might be a way to get companies to respond to that. Any questions on complexity? So let's talk about debt. There are two places in valuation where you're going to encounter debt. The first is in the cost of capital calculation. You have to decide what to include in debt. And remind me again what the rule for that was. What debt do I include in the cost of capital calculation? All interest-bearing debt and lease commitments. But I stay narrow. Narrow in what sense? You see underfunded pension obligations, the balance sheets. Can I count that as this? Don't do it. Underfunded health care, don't do it. And you know why I don't want you to do it? Because in your zeal to be conservative, because that's why you want to count it in, guess what you end up doing? You inflate your debt ratio of your company. And if you inflate your debt ratio, guess what happens to your cost of capital? It actually gets lower. So when I do cost of capital, I'm going to be narrow in my definition of debt. Only interest-bearing debt and lease commitments, and I'm done. 
But again, you encounter debt in a different place. It's when you, when you finish getting the present value of the cash flows, and this is a variant of what you saw in the question I started, you have to s decide what your debt to, su to subtract out. And here, you have to make different choices. As I said, market value debt is what you always use when you do cost of capital, but sometimes in acquisitions, especially if you're acquiring a company and your company's good credit standing, you could make the argument that you're gonna subtract out book value. So you've used market value debt for your cost of capital, but you're actually shifting to book value when you do this. There's nothing inconsistent about it. This is also your last chance to take care of anything else that worries you. Like what? You're a tobacco company, and you have a lawsuit hanging over your head. Right now, the lawsuit is just wending its way through the courts, but should you as an investor worry about the lawsuit? I think so. And the way you bring that in is you bring in your expectation of what it will cost you. If you're valuing any of the cannabis stocks right now, canopy growth all the way down, this is something that is going to have to be dealt with because sooner or later, something is going to come out from the smoking of marijuana, which is going to be bad, and they're going to, it's, it's almost predictable that it's going to happen. And because it's going to happen, your job is to try to incorporate it into your value equity. So for cost of capital, keep your definition narrow and market value. But when you're deciding what debt to subtract out, sometimes you might be subtracting out market value of debt. If you're doing a liquidation valuation, you might be subtracting out book value of debt because the bank is not going to say, I'll take 80 cents of the dollar. You're liquidating the company. They want all of the debt back. It's a little more malleable in terms of the rules, but this is also the place where you bring in whatever else concerns you. A lot of older companies in the US have legacy costs. And the reason they have legacy costs is very simple. In the 20th century, if you went to work for a big company, you usually got a pension, a defined pension. So basically, it wasn't money set aside where the pension was unknown. They actually gave it. So the GMs, and the, in fact, Disney gave a pension until 2012. The reason I know is my son was joined Disney the last year they actually offered a pension. Now it's a defined contribution plan. You put it in, you get whatever you want. You think, where is that going? If you have a defined benefit plan, you have an expectation that you've got to make those payments. And if you have an underfunded plan, you essentially have the equivalent of something you've got to make up. As an equity investor in this company, that might not be debt for cost of capital. In fact, you're not funding projects with that. But when you think about what's my equity worth in this company, you might subtract out underfunded pension obligations. Companies are also showing underfunded healthcare obligations now. If they're, you know. So these are things that might not be debt for cost of capital that you're subtracting out. But the other thing, as I said, is if you're worried about lawsuits, and in the US, you are the target of a lawsuit, no matter what company you are, this is your last chance to deal with it. I remember about 10 years ago, I was sitting in my office, a couple of law students, and any law students in this class? You're afraid to identify yourself over there? Yeah. Right. There were a couple of law students came in 10 years ago. This, they were in the last year of law school. And they said, we don't want to be lawyers. I said, you're facing an existential crisis. Why are you talking to me? Go talk to the dean of the law school. I'd make you go through law school. He said, we don't want to be lawyers. We want to be, you know, we want to be in finance, investing. I said, okay, so you're going to start from scratch and build up your finance skills. Or, they said, that sounds like a lot of work. Is there something? I, I said, there is a way in which you might be able to take your legal backing and make it your competitive edge. I said, why don't you hang up a shingle that says, you're focused only on companies that are targeting litigation. That's all you focus on. You're in, you, so you're going to do investment analysis, and you're not even going to do the full-fledged cash flows and discount, right? You're going to let other people do it. What you're going to focus on are two things. You're going to focus in on the outcome, the expected outcome of these lawsuits. Because the reality is none of us can figure that out, right? Because it's not just will you lose the lawsuit, the appeals process. Because remember, many of the tobacco firms would lose lawsuits. Where the initial lawsuit, the jury would say $2 billion to the defendant. By the time they work through the appeals process, it'll be down to $2 million. Don't ask me how you lost that many zeros. But maybe that's your skill set, is you can work with you know, the kinds of issues that come up with litigation, because it is a big factor that drives, I mean, if you want to see a company that right now is on a regulatory legal, take a look at PG&E. PG&E is, um, is the California utility that recently declared bankruptcy. You know why they had to declare bankruptcy? Because during those fires, it turned out that the fires were triggered by PG&E lines that somehow created the fire. So they're being sued right and left. 
there is no way that, uh, that they have enough money to cover those. They now have thrown themselves at the mercy of the California legislature. God help you, because that's not a place you want to go for mercy if you're a corporation. And they're hoping to get, and the reason the California legislature might have to give them protection is, the alternative is they go bankrupt and nobody has power. So, but that's what you're feeling. This is not a traditional problem of estimating cash flows. This is entirely a question of how will those lawsuits play out? How will the legislation protect them? And if you can estimate that, pg and &E could be an incredible investment. I mean, even in the last three months, I think the stock has doubled in price because people's assessment of the expected litigation cost has changed. So in some companies, this might be the fulcrum that drives the value of your equity, in which case you have to bring it in. Finally, let's talk about equity compensation or stock-based compensation. Okay. Stock-based compensation can take one of two forms. It can either be in the form of options or restricted stock. You understand options, right? Basically, you're a op you know, manager. I give you an option. The option gives you the right to buy a share for the next five. And that's the thing about employee options. They're usually five, ten-year long-term options with a fixed price. And until 2006 or 2007, they were the dominant way in which employees got compensation. And you can see why. What did accountants let you do until 2006 and 2007? When you granted options that were at the money, they treated them as free. So companies liked them for a very simple reason, which is you could give away half the company and the accountants didn't seem to notice. In 2007, finally, accountants wake up and they change the laws. The law after 2007 on options is when you grant options, those options have to be valued as options. Good sense finally prevails. And you've got to treat it for what they are, which is compensation expenses. So that advantage disappeared. So magically in 2007, companies decided that options were not that good anymore. So increasingly since 2007, companies have moved to what are called restricted stock. So you go to work for an Amazon or a Lyft or an Uber. I give you 5,000 as your salary. You're saying, I won't work for 5,000. I know. And I give you 250,000 in restricted stock. So that's the first thing to remember. Companies use options and restricted stock for a very simple reason. They don't have the cash to pay you. And if they want you to come and work for them and not for Goldman Sachs, they got to give you a ton, a boatload of restricted stock. What's restricted about these shares? I'm sorry, what? First, there's a vesting restriction, but that's true for even options. You've got to stay around for a certain period before you can do that. But that's actually the smaller part of the restriction. You can't sell the shares. Even after you get vested, there's a certain period that you've got to hold the shares. So they're like shares that you can with no liquidity. So basically, companies grant these because it's their way of paying compensation, market compensation for employees, even though they don't have the cash. So when we look at these, these stock-based competition, two key questions we face when you look at a company is, if company's been doing this for a while, there's this deadweight cost they've created. In what form? They have lots of restricted stock they've been giving over time that's out there. They also have options they've been giving over time that are live. So that's the first issue you have to deal with. How do you deal with those options and restricted stock that have already been granted? If you take a look at the Lyft prospectus, a big chunk of the shares, almost the equivalent of 20% of the shares are in the form of restricted stock units that are either not vested or on the verge of vesting, but they're out there. So there's a dead weight cost. But there's a second question you also have to answer. These companies are not done. Lyft, in addition to all those restricted stock that you see out there, will continue to issue restricted stock. You can almost guarantee it. Why? Because those guys still have to be paid next year, two years out. In fact, I, when they promise the $10,000 per driver, I wonder how much of it will be in the form. You know, Lyft has said that they're going to give 10000 for every Lyft driver. I'll believe it when I see it. But I'm not sure how much of that will take the form of cash and how much will just be in the form of restricted stock units. So the second question you've got to deal with is, since they're not quite done, how do I as a shareholder today bring that into my value today? So I want to deal with both those questions. But let's start with the easier problem. If you have restricted stock units, and thank God this is the prevailing way in which companies pay their shares, your, your life got a little simpler. In the case of Lyft, what did I with do with restricted stock units? I just added them to the outstanding shares, and I treated them as shares outstanding. 
I know there are vesting requirements and liquidity, but I really don't care that much. The vesting, you know why I don't care? When you see 30 million restricted stock units, I can almost guarantee you that this is not a democratic process where every employee owns 3,000 restricted stock. There's some guy out there with 22 million restricted stock units. A lot of people own these tiny pieces. And guess what? That guy with 22 million restricted stock units is going to stay around to get vested. You can almost guarantee that. Why, because why would you leave $250 million? The bulk of restricted stock is going to get vested for a simple reason. It's very concentrated in a few hands, and people have too much to lose. So I just ignore vesting. If that troubles you, put a probability. Say 95% of restricted stock, and if it makes you feel better, take 95% of the restricted stock units and add them on. The lack of liquidity is an issue, but it's not worth finessing. So if you have restricted stock units that you've already issued, I'm going to count them in. So when with Lyft, I counted all restricted stock units, the non-vested units, because I, to me, they're all shares outstanding. But when you have options outstanding, you have a challenge. And here's why. What did the option give you? The right to buy an additional share. If I gave employees the right to buy an additional share at whatever the prevailing market price is, I'm giving away nothing. But because I give you the right to buy the share at a fixed price, I have to worry, and here's why. If my stock price goes up, and that's the only condition these options kick in, you will exercise your right and buy the shares from me at $10 when, in fact, they're trading at 25 That's why, as a common stockholder, I have to worry. It's not that additional. It's not the dilution. That's often a, mis a misconception about options. The it's not the dilution. The dilution at the discounted price that kills me, and I've got to factor that in. And here we have to face the reality. It's not what the option is worth today, an exercise I'd have to worry about. It's what the option will potentially be worth in the future if the stock price goes up. You say, how the hell am I going to figure that out? That's exactly what option pricing models try to do, is they factor in that probability distribution for prices, and they come up with an expected value today of what the option could be worth in the future. So if you have options, you've got to value them as options. And that is basically what I'm going to do with a very simple example. So here's what the example looks like. A company is 100 million in free cash flows to, uh, to the firm, growing 3% a year in perpetuity. Cost of capital is 8%. So I do the math. I come up with a value for the firm of 2 billion. It has a, a billion dollars in debt. I subtract out the billion. I have value of equity of a billion. Initially, let's keep it simple. The company has 100 million shares outstanding, $10 per share. Very similar to the exercise we started the class with. Now I'm going to give 10 million options at the money. And already I've raised this question. We decided that when you give 10 million options, even though they're at the money options, I'm giving away something valuable. And if I'm giving away something valuable, my value for, per share is going to drop. So I'm going to take you through three approaches, starting with the bludgeon approach, as I call it, moving all the way across to what I think is the right approach for dealing with these 10 million options. Here's what the bludgeon approach does. It says, look, when I issue options, what I worry about is dilution. The dilution comes from the fact that there will be more shares outstanding. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the billion dollars in equity that I got, and instead of dividing by 100 million shares, I divide by 110 million, including the options as you do the exercise. This is called the fully diluted approach because everything you're doing is in the denominator. The value you're going to get is about $9.09. I, I can almost guarantee you that you will undervalue your firm if you do this for a simple reason. When those 10 million options get exercised, which is what you're assuming will happen here, does something else happen? What is the exercise price on the option? $10. So they're going to pay you $10 per option. 10 million times $10 is 100 million that's going to come into the firm. You completely missed it, right? So what's an easy fix? Add the 100 million to the numerator. That approach is called the treasury stock approach. In the treasury stock approach, here's what I do. I take my estimated value of equity. I take the options that you have outstanding times the exercise price. I add the 100 million to the numerator. And I divide that by the total number of shares. And magically, the value per share doesn't seem to change. But it's actually not magical. When you use this approach, you're ex essentially valuing options at exercise value. And if you remember, the exercise value of those 10 million options, because I granted them at the money, was zero. So in this approach, I'm going to tell you, you're OK. Don't worry. I can give away as many options as you want, as I want, and you're not affected. You know it's not true, but the math seems to work out, right? But as I said, options shouldn't be valued at exercise value. They have to be valued 
as options. So you know what the right way to do this is? When I give 10 million options away, I'm giving away a piece of your equity. That's basically what I'm doing. If I can somehow tell you how much that piece of equity is worth, you can take it out of the billion, and then whatever's left over remains yours. In other words, I've got to value the options as options. And to do that, here's the approach I'm going to do. I'm going to do the traditional discounted cash flow valuation. I'm not even worrying about options when I do this. That's why I don't do things on a per share basis anymore. Per share valuations break down very, very quickly because you've got options coming in. I do everything on an aggregated basis. I come up with the value of the firm, the value of the equity. Then I value the options, and I'd include warrants in this and convertible bond, uh, conversion options in this. Value the options as options. I subtract the value of the options from the equity value. You see why I subtract it out? I've given that away. And then I divide the remaining value by the 100 million shares, the actual shares outstanding. I don't have to worry about dilution and future share issues. They're all reflected in the option value. For a long time, people fought this. And the reason they did it was mechanical. Option pricing models, what are the, what are the two most common option pricing models? There's Black-Scholes and the binomial. Both the Black-Scholes and the binomial were designed to value short-term options on the CBOE. So if you look at the models, they're great. They're actually incredibly clever models. But they're designed to value three-month options on listed stock. And what do I describe employee options as? First, they're really long-term. So you're taking what? So I'll give you one example of why the three months to 10 years matters. When you use an option pricing model, one of the inputs you need is the variance of the underlying asset, the variance of the stock. And we assume that that variance does not change over the life of the option. Now we have a three month option, that's not a big deal. The variance of IBM is not gonna change very much in three months. But if I give you a 10 year option, it becomes a much more tenuous assumption because I'm assuming your variance won't change over the next 10 years, so that's the first issue. Second, these were option pricing models designed to value listed options in the CBOE. The company had nothing to do with it. So when those options get exercised, the share count doesn't change. There's no effect on the actual company. So you could just value. The, but when you have employee options and you exercise them, you affect the company, right? Because the company issues more. There's a dilution effect. So that's the second problem. And third, if you buy an option on the CBOE on a stock and the stock price rises, and you have still time left on the option, what's the most logical thing to do? Rather than exercise the option, what, what should you do? Sell the option to somebody else, even if you don't want to hold it, you can sell, and you get the exercise value. Plus. So in the real world, when you look at listed options, they almost never get exercised early, they just get sold. Employee options are messier. Why? Because they're illiquid, you can't sell them. So if you're an employee at Uber, you're terrified. Because even as the stock price rises, even if it goes public and stock price rises, 90% of your wealth is in those options. You know this is too good to last. There's nothing you can do about it. So guess what happens with employee options that you don't see happening with conventional options? They get exercised early. Because if you can't sell it, even though there's a time premium, you know, I can't wait. I'm going to be you know, wiped out of the stock drop. So employee options get exercised far more frequently early than regular options. So people say you can't use black shows because it's long term. These are options that can affect the stock price but through the dilution. And there are options that can be exercised early. Remember the black shows was designed to value European options. Remember that? Um, it's unfortunate we attached a geographical name to it. It's got nothing to do with geography. A European option is an option that cannot be exercised before expiration. You can get away with that unlisted option much more difficult to do. For a long time, the people's defense was, hey, you can't use traditional option pricing models. And the people said, you can adapt the black shoals to value long-term options, to allow for liquidity investing, and to capture dilution. And there is a version of the option pricing models you can use for employee options. So that defense of I can't do it really doesn't hold because you can value these options as options. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my employee options in this case, the 10 million options that are at the money. I'm going to use essentially the maturity, but if I wanted to I was worried about early exercise, I can take 10 year options and use it five years instead. In fact, studies show consistently that employee options get exercised about 50 to 60% through maturity. So you can use half the maturity if you want. I use the variance of the stock, I cut, so I plug it through. And the value that I get for the option is $5 
and 42 cents per option. That's at the money, but because it's 10 years and it's uncertain, the options are actually worth $5.42 per option. How many options I give the CEO? 10 million options. 10 million times 54, $5.42 is 54.2 million. Don't tell me I shouldn't be upset. You just took $54.2 million of my equity and gave it away. You can't get, take, create money out of something. So you're essentially transferring wealth. You might have a really good reason. This might, guy might be the greatest CEO on the face of the earth. But my value per share is going to reflect the fact that you've given away 54.2 million. In fact, here's the right way to deal with options. I'm going to value the equity, the billion dollars. I'm going to subtract out the 54.2 million, which is the value of the options as options. I'm going to take the 945.8 million that I'm left with. And that I'm going to divide by the actual shares outstanding. Because I've already taken into account the options, the warrants, the convertibles. The value per share I'm going to have after the option grant is $9.46. So any questions on employee options and how to deal with them? So you've got to deal with them frontly. And today, it's, life's got a little simpler because you know, people have to use option pricing models when they grant these options so they're more used. They're more open to the possibility you've got to bring in the options. But don't let people nitpick you on this because they're going to take issue with, oh, why are you using a Black-Scholes model? It's not a European option, it's an American option. You know what? I can live with the kind of adjustments I have to make. Yes? Yeah. There's a circularity here, right? Because if you think about it, the underlying stock, this is the dilution effect, which is if I try, let's suppose a stock is 10, it, it goes to 10, 20, and my exercise is price is 10. If this were a traditional option, exercising should make me 20 cents, right? But let's say I'm the CEO, I announce I'm going to exercise my 10 million option. The minute I announce that, guess what's going to happen to the stock price? It's going to drop down. So in a sense, that's what, so this option pricing model, you notice I've set the iteration box in Excel, because it actually, actually has to recalculate what the price will be if I try to exercise the option. That's the dilution adjustment I've made to the black shoals that allows me to use the black shoals to value an option that creates dilution. Yeah. Finally, there's a, there's a very little mechanical question. And this is, the tax laws are still very different from the accounting laws. The accountants have now caught up with the reality that options are options. You should value them as options and subtract out the value of the option as an expense. The tax guy, though, seems to operate in a different premise. You know how you're taxed on options? It's when you exercise the option. So the day, in fact, Mark Zuckerberg exercised his option at Facebook, or the day of the IPO, he had a huge tax bill. Because while he was being given the option, it was not treated as income. But the minute he exercised it, the tax guy woke up and said, you have $350 million in income. We're going to tax you on it. It's neither here nor there, but you can't create that tax thing in your discounted cash flow valuation separate. It's too much of a pain. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, look, if you have a lot of options you're granting, and they've already been granted, I'm going to give you the tax benefit of that option by multiplying whatever 54.8 million that I got by one minus the tax rate. Because you're effectively not paying 54.8 million because you can get a tax benefit. It's a little, little mechanical adjustment but something to reflect the fact that option exercise, when it happens, is in fact creating a tax deductible expense. So that's how we deal with the legacy effects of options and restricted stock from the past. It takes care of the problem from the past. So if you're valuing a company, that's done. That's no longer going to issue stock-based compensation because now they have the cash to pay their employees. This is all you have to do. But if you're valuing a Cisco, a Lyft, an Uber, this is the start of the process because another problem waiting for you. And that problem is, this company will continue to grant options in the future. And it's amazing how people make this more complicated than it has to be. Remember what I said at the start of this discussion? Companies grant options because, not because they want to align interest, but because they don't have the cash to pay you. They're doing it because they want to compensate you. What do we do with the rest of compensation expenses when we do cash flows? They're expenses, they lower my operating income, they lower my cash flow, lower value. Just because you use stock-based compensation, I'm not going to throw the rules out. I'm going to say Lyft's expenses are huge because they do a lot of, so I'm going to, when I have options being continuing to be granted, I'm going to treat it as an expense item, reduce your earnings and cash flows by that. And that looks like you're double punishing the company, but you're actually punishing it for two different reasons. 
The first one where you value existing options and reduce the value of equity is for past option grants. The second one is for continuing to grant options, it'll lower your value. Companies will push back. You know what their defense against this is? They say it's stock based, it shouldn't affect my cash flows, which is ridiculous. Because all you've done is skipped a step. Do you see what I mean by skipped a step? If these companies had granted these options, had issued the options in the market, got the cash and paid you, it would have been a cash expense, right? What did they do? They skipped it. They did a barter system. And if I let that get by, I've created an opening where you can make your revenues into operating income. Do you see how? You pay everybody with options. The landscaper, here's a few options. The guy who does the painting in the front, here's a few options. And then you come to me and say, look, I have no expenses. We're letting companies get away with murder by letting them ba add back stock-based comp. It's a horrible practice, but every company does it. They create a pro forma for you, right? We're really not losing money. Look, if we add back all the stock-based compensation, we're profitable, right? So what will happen tomorrow if you stop issuing stock-based compensation? You'll have no employees left because this is the only way you pay them. So if this is the way you operate, I'm going to treat it as an operating expense, and I'm going to reduce your earnings and cash flows, and I'm going to reduce my value per equity to reflect that. Finally, the reason I think we worry so much about options, the kinds of companies that grant options tend to be young companies, risky companies. You think, so what? One of the key inputs that drives the value of an option is the variance in the stock price, right? So when a Lyft grants options, it has a much bigger effect than when Kraft Heinz grants options. The kinds of companies where options are a problem are exactly the kinds of companies where you're going to have the biggest drag on value. So we all, you know, when you read about these big scandals of a CEO being granted 300 million options, half a billion options, part of it comes from boards being sloppy. Where they're told, hey, these options have no value. Their exercise value is nothing. We're just giving away nothing. Part of it is just the fact that there's a transfer of wealth going on that we're not capturing well in our valuations, and we have to start to be a little more rigorous and bring those in. So be ready for that debate you're going to have. I guarantee if you're in this business of finance investing, you know, you're going to have people arguing that stock-based compensation is really not an expense. You should add it back. Don't fall for it. There is no good excuse for doing what's being done. It is an expense. It reduces your income. It reduces your value per share, and you have to factor it in. Any questions? Yeah. So now we're going to do, you know, uh, that was a little heavy. So now we're going to do what I think is the funnest part of valuation. Remember that question I asked you at the start of the class? Are you more naturally a storyteller or a number cruncher? And I asked you to identify yourself and what, you, what comes more easily to you. And I said, the reason we care is a good valuation I described as a bridge between stories and numbers. What I meant by that is if you show me a DCF this Friday, and I point to your revenues in your 10, so why are your revenues 5 billion? The answer I don't want to hear is because I used a 30% growth rate for the first five years and 6% thereafter. That tells me absolutely nothing. Tell me your story for the company that explains why they can have 5 billion in revenues, why they can have 35% margins. Conversely, if you tell me story after story, and I say, well, that's a nice story. What number reflects that story? So what number? I don't, know, don't talk about numbers. I just tell stories. That's really not a valuation either. A good valuation connects stories to numbers. And I said, this is a, an antidote to the delusions that we operate under. Remember those delusions. If you're a number cruncher, the delusions are, first, the delusion of precision. When in doubt, you add decimals. It makes you feel better. <laughs> Second, the delusion of being objective. I just use numbers. Those guys are biased. Oh, I just use numbers. I'm just being scientific. And the third is the delusion of being in control. I can estimate whatever I want about Lyft. But if I fall into the trap of thinking, I've estimated the cash flow, so I know what's going to happen to Lyft, I'm in deep trouble. Similarly, if you're a storyteller, you have your own delusions, right? You think if you're creative, nobody should slap a number on you. Have you ever been around creative people, really, really creative people, and if you're a numbers person, you're, like, you're treated like having the equivalent of the plague? Don't talk numbers to me. It might ruin my creative thinking. There was this, the, the person who produced The Lion King on Broadway. She's a very, f I, I forget her name. You know, I, she gave a press conference where I almost felt like jumping out and slapping her across the face. 
But she said, I'm a creative person. I don't care about cause. So this is, I, this is an impingement on my... So you're being paid, right? I hope they're paying you in dollars, not in creative stuff. If I'm paying you in dollars, you can be as creative as you want, but don't tell me that being creative means the license of, hey, I don't have to look at the numbers. The second is creative people think if they tell you a really big story, I have to give you a really big number. I told you really, I should be worth at least 10 billion, right? I talked about brand name and strategic and China all in one story. And the third is creative people love anecdotal evidence. They're like my mother-in-law. I don't mean this as a compliment. Have you ever told you my story about my mother-in-law and, and the Volkswagen bug? No, I'll, should, I'll tell you the story. She comes up with the most outrageous conclusions. She never reasons away, she just concludes. And I always fall into the trap of asking her, Judy, how the hell did you come up with that? I should stop one of these days, because she always tells me. But 10 years ago, we're sitting at dinner. Out of the blue, she, my mother-in-law says, the best car to drive in a snowstorm is a Volkswagen Bug. You know the old Volkswagen Bugs? They weighed like 200 pounds for the motorcycle engine. The engine was in the back. It's like a death trap waiting to happen. You could just pick it up and move it. I said, what? A Volkswagen Bug in a snowstorm? How did you come up with this? The minute I asked this question, I, know, I knew I shouldn't have because she told me. She said 23 years prior, and I could see the story coming, but too late to stop that train. She'd been in Lake Tahoe driving a Volkswagen bug from the grocery store back home in the middle of a snowstorm. And she made it back home. And two cars did not. So you're saying, so? She said, that proves it. A Volkswagen bug is the best car to drive. Amazing, sample size of one, how much you've extrapolated. Creative people love anecdotal evidence. They talk about that time they did this and this happened, therefore, you know, the rest follows. But if you hang out, if you're a creative person, you hang out with other creative people, you don't notice this as a problem, right? You each tell you some anecdotal stuff. You can, you can solve all the problems of the world with anecdotes. It's four anecdotes. If we only did this, we ran the world, the world would be a different place. And four numbers people get together, they add decimals, keep adding decimals, they all pat each other on the back, and nobody notices there's a problem. I call this the biggest hidden secret in valuation. And I also said, this is a secret that was so hidden, I didn't know it the first six years I taught valuation. So I came late to this game. I came late to this game because I discovered I had no faith. I had, I needed some, I, it's partly because I knew how easily I could move the numbers and the value. That I learned that I, I had to have something else holding my numbers together. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you through the process by which I value a company. You see, having been doing this all class, I've taken you through the mechanical part of the process, right? Cash flows, growth rates, discount rates, all important, understanding those. But I'm going to take you through the process of, you know, I want to you know, who should I value tomorrow? Pinterest, Levi Strauss. I think I value EasyJet tomorrow. You, you know, EasyJet, part of the reason is it's, it's a UK airline, and you know what's happening. On, we really don't know what's happening, and that's part of the problem in the next two weeks. With Brexit, EasyJet gets almost 70% of its revenues from the EU. So whether there's no deal Brexit, bad deal Brexit, or no Brexit, you're going to have very different effects on EasyJet. So tomorrow I think I'll value EasyJet, but you know, next week I might value Pinterest. Let's see how it goes. So I'm going to take you through the process uh, with which I would go through this valuation. The process always starts with a story. It starts with a story, not with a spreadsheet. So for those of you who haven't started your DCF, and I know a lot of people in this room have not, and I won't ask you for a show of hands, the process of valuation starts with a story to the company. And to tell the story, you've got to understand the company, the business, the competition. I call this surveying the landscape. It sounds fancy, but you've got to understand what a company does before you can value it. If you think Cisco makes vegetable oil, I don't care how good you are at estimating cash flows, and you are screwed. This valuation is going nowhere. Because you're going to be looking at the size of the vegetable oil market, and you're going to be doing all kinds of great things, but you're looking at the wrong company. Incidentally, if you're asking, isn't that what's, uh, that's Crisco. This is Cisco. It doesn't do any vegetable oil. It has nothing to do with vegetable oil. 
But my point is you need to understand the company. So I'm going to use as my lab experiment a company. So you can see this process play out. It was in June of 2014. June 4th, exactly, is the date. And I remember that I opened up the Wall Street Journal, and there's a little article. And here's what it said. A company called Uber had raised $3 billion from venture capitalists who had priced the company at $17 billion. What's the word that I just used to describe what venture capitalists do? Price the company. Not value the company, price the company. And we'll talk about the contrast later. And I was surprised. I was surprised because I'd never heard of Uber in June of 2014. You think, what did you do, live underground? Yes, I did actually live underground because in the city I would take subways everywhere. I never took cabs. I, no, I had no idea what Uber did. Let me take that back. I'd seen the word Uber on my credit card statements for the two months leading into June of 2014. It turned out that my second son was going to college in North Carolina then, was using Uber and backing it up with my credit card. I don't know how that happened. But I really thought he was taking German language classes. <laughs> There's no umlaut on the you should have given it away. So I read this article and I decide I need to find out more about Uber. So guess who I call first? My son. But he was still sleeping. It was only 11.30 in the morning. <laughs> but he kept what college student hours, which basically I think means you go to sleep whenever you go to sleep and you wake up whenever you wake up. So I decided to call my niece, who was living and working in Chicago. And because she was working, she was technically awake, which means she was at her desk with her eyes partly open, <laughs> but in a horrible mood. She says, what do you want? This is how you greet your favorite uncle. I said, have you ever used this Uber. She said, it's a ride-sharing company. I said, what the hell is a ride-sharing company? She said, I don't have the time to talk to you right now. <laughs> Why don't you download the app and find out for yourself? Hangs up the phone. You should talk to a mother about this. But then I downloaded the app sitting up in my office. I hit the app, and magical things start to happen. A GPS opens up on my phone. And I can see a car trying to drive towards me. Why trying? This is New York City. You don't get from point A to point B. You try. You go one way street, back one way talk. But I could see, and I could see a name, George, in the car. This has never happened to me with a yellow cab. Fascinated what George and his transportation vehicle navigate their way to 44 West 4th Street. He pulls up in front. I run out there and say, hi, George. He says, I noticed you didn't enter a destination. Where do you want to go? I said, nowhere in particular, but can you drive me around for 30 minutes? I have some questions to ask you. <laughs> he thought for a moment I was a serial killer. Uh, but, <laughs> but then he took a second look and said, I can take this guy, get in the back seat. So I get in the big back seat. I start asking him questions. I said, is this an Uber car you're driving? He said, no, this is my car. I said, are you an Uber employee? He said, I'm an independent contractor. I said, why do you do this? He said, I have a regular job. I don't make much money on it. I already own this car. I pay insurance in it. This allows me to make a second income on what I already own. So I said, why do you need Uber? He said, in New York City, it's illegal to stop on the street and offer somebody a ride. Uber connects me with customers. Kind of got what he was doing. I remember asking, do you, do you tell the insurance company you're doing this on the side? He said, what they don't know can't hurt them. I kind of let that go. Basically, he was taking excess capacity in his car and monetizing it, if you want to use you know, econ terms for it. So 30 minutes later, he drops me off. I offered to pay him. He says, you don't have to pay me. I said, it's free? He said, it's not free. Did you enter your credit card when you entered? When you used it? I said, yes. He said, I'll charge you. I remember asking him, how do you get paid? And he said, Uber will send me 80% of whatever the fare is. And I remember asking, why 80%? He said, I don't know. That's what they all do, drives off. At that stage, I knew why Uber did what they did for connecting cars to customers. They get to keep 20. This is a nice, sweet business to be in, which left me with one final unresolved question. What makes people like my son and my niece pick Uber? To give you some background, this son of mine is different from my other kids. He will not hail a cab. I kind of, it's not even in his frame of reference, onto the street and I hail a cab like this. So he's taking car service. So I called him and said, so what do you like about Uber? And this is at 3.30 in the afternoon. No reason to be sleeping now. He's actually awake. I said, why do you take a ride-sharing service? I acted like 
You know, at first I put him on the defensive. I said, I notice you've been using ride sharing, using my credit card to back it up, acting like I knew what this was right from the beginning. I said, why would you need a ride sharing service? You own a car down in North Carolina. Why don't you drive the car? He said, Dad, on Friday nights <laughs> and Saturday nights, I really like Uber. <laughs> now, as a parent, there are some questions you don't follow up on. I kind of got it. I said, OK. I said, what do you like about Uber? He said, I can call the car from the bar. I said, that's a plus. I said, you must wait forever, right? He said, no, they come sooner than a cab. I said, they must be much more expensive, right? They're cheaper than a cab. The cars must be filthy, right? He said, they're cleaner than a cab. I said, let me get this straight. You can call the car from the bar. They come sooner than a cab. They're cheaper than a cab. And they're cleaner than a cab. That's when I knew cab service was destined for doom. The only final question was, what's so special about Uber? Why couldn't I go into my basement, if I had one, and start a ride-sharing service? It's connecting customers to cars, right? All you need is a big enough computer. And there are a couple of things where I think Uber had an advantage over me. One was $3 billion. They had it, I didn't, and I think that puts you at a little bit of a disadvantage. The second is, this is a business with networking benefits. I know that's a buzzword. But what does that mean when I say networking benefits? What does it mean? When a business has networking benefits, what is true about that business? Switching I'm sorry? Switching, switching costs is one aspect, but it's more than switching costs, right? There are other businesses you can assume. Networking benefits is actually an even bigger issue. Yeah. So no, in normal businesses, as you get bigger, it gets more and more difficult to get bigger because you get the easiest customers first, and you've got to work harder and harder. When you have a networking benefit, as you get bigger, it actually gets easier to get bigger. And part of the reason this happens in ride-sharing is very simple. Let's say you're a driver with a car who wants to join a ride-sharing service. There are two ride-sharing services in your town. One is the dominant ride-sharing service. The other is a startup. And it has to be exclusive. You have to pick one over the other. Which one are you going to pick? You're going to go with the dominant ride-sharing service. Why? Because that's where all the customers are. It's the same reason if you wanted to auction something, and you say, I don't like eBay. They're so big. I'll go to some small auction site. You can auction it, but nobody's coming there, and you're never going to sell it. Networking benefits basically means you're going to get winner-take-all businesses. Right? There's going to be a tipping point where companies are essentially going to dominate businesses. So from that perspective, if I started, even with $3 billion, if I'm starting up, I'm going to have a much tougher mountain to climb. So after I did, you can you even call this research? I talked to my son. I talked to my niece. I talked to the Uber driver. What did I not do? I didn't pour over financials. Why did I not pour over financials? What financials would I have poured over? Not only was this a private company, this was a very private, private company. In what sense? They were incredibly opaque about the numbers. The only two numbers I knew about Uber in 2014 were their gross billings and how much money they lost. That's it. Two numbers. There were no full financial statements. So for those of you trying to value companies with only one year of financial, don't even come and complain to me. Right? At least you have one year of financials. I had two numbers. And for Uber, I'm going to argue that even if I had all of the financials, it wouldn't have helped me that much. Why not? What would I have learned by looking at the financials? They had little revenues, lots of losses, big deal. I'd have known that even before I looked at it. It's all in the future. The research I'm doing here is less about the company and more about the market. Less about the company and more about its products, its services. And what I've learned, I actually put into a picture. And I try to do this with almost every company that I value. Is what I've learned, why customers like the product, why employees work for the company, what is compared to advantage. So when I tell my story, I can refer back to this picture. So that's the first stop, is learn about the company. Your second stop is you've got to stop and tell a story about your company. And here's my advice to you. Remember, this is a business story, not a creative novel. Don't create characters who wander on and wander off for no reason at all. Here's what you should not be telling as a business story. About 10 years ago, my oldest son comes to me with a reading suggestion. He said, Dad, you got to read this book. It's amazing. He hands me the book. I almost fall over. It's like 1,200 pages thick. I turn and look at the front of the book. It says, Game of Thrones, George R.R. R. Martin. 
And I tried. I take my kids' reading suggestions very seriously. I tried, and two weeks later I called my son and said, Ryan, I'm too old for this. <laughs> there are hundreds of characters in this book. They wander on, they wander off, they die, they come back to life, they're good, they're bad. I have lost track of everything in the book. I give up. If you're telling a business story, don't make it Game of Thrones. You don't have seven seasons and 70 episodes to tell your story. You're like 15 minutes. So keep it simple and keep it focused. What's the end game for every business? No matter what kind of business you run, if you're trying to tell me you want me to invest in your business, what do you have to show me? What do you have to show me? That at least you thought about the possibility that you might have to make money in the future. Is that asking for too much? At least that you have a pathway you have. You'd be amazed how many founder pitches I've sat through. 20 minutes in, especially when you have a geek presenting an app. Look how neat my app is. Look how many people download it. 20 minutes in, you put up your hands and say, how do you hope to make money in the app? So I haven't thought about it, but let me tell you how neat my app is and how many people download it, how many users I have. I mean, there's a reason MoviePass has actually got to where they are, right? It could not have been that they thought through a business model. They could say, look how many users we have. Look how many users we have. So keep it simple. Keep it focused. And be reality-based. Don't tell me fairy tales. Basically, that's my rule. So I'm going to try to follow that rule. Uber here was my initial story. My, there's a reason I've attached the June 2014 to my story. I valued Uber every year since 2014. Do you think my story has changed? Why has it changed? Because the world has changed around me. Anybody who stays attached to the story says, I've told the story, that's it, I'm done, is asking for trouble. This story has changed. But that's the reality of valuation. Your stories will change, your value will change. So here was my initial story for Uber, and every word in the story is going to play out in my numbers. So I want you to keep track of the words. I described Uber as an urban car service company. Already I'm telling you where I see Uber succeeding, right? In cities and car service, which will attract new users into the business, like whom? People like my son and my niece who would never have taken cabs are going to come into the business, which will expand the business, with local networking benefits. Remember what I said about networking benefits? You become the largest ride-sharing company in New York. There's going to be a tipping point where you end up becoming the dominant player. You say, what's the local doing in there? Let's say Uber becomes the largest ride-sharing company in New York, and I fly to Toronto like I'm supposed to tomorrow. When I land in Toronto, do I care about the largest ride-sharing company in New York? Not really. I care about the largest ride-sharing company in Toronto. In my, in my story, here's what can happen. Uber can end up taking New York. Lyft can take Chicago. Didi can take Beijing. Grab can take Kuala Lumpur. And Ola can take Mumbai. You think, who cares? When I start to assign market share to Uber, that's going to play, whether I give them a 30% market share or a 10% market share. And finally, I'm going to assume they can keep doing what they're doing. First, in keeping 20% of the fare. This is completely arbitrary, right? I'm sure Travis Kelly woke up one day and said, hey, what should I take? 20% sounds good. It's not like there's some deep science here. Yeah? Why not 15? Why not 18? Why not 12? I'm going to assume they can keep the 20% going. And I can al I'm also assuming in June of 2014 that their existing business model will remain their prevailing business model, which is they don't own the cars and they don't hire the drivers. That was my June 2014 story for Uber. Now, before I start to convert the story into value, I've got to stop and make sure I'm not deluding myself. And let me explain what I mean by this. When I tell any business story, or when I listen to a business story, how many of you watch Shark Tank? Okay. Next time you watch Shark Tank, make it an active exercise, which means don't eat chips and stuff your face. Just act as if this is, you're a shark. Here's what I want you to think about. When you listen to that story that, that shark, it's whoever's pitching is in, I want you to ask the question, uh, the three questions. Is this story possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? Sounds like I'm playing on words, right? Lots of things are possible. But there are some stories we listen to. That's not going to happen. That's a fairy tale. But assuming a story is possible, I want you to take it to the next step. Has somebody else done something like this? That makes it plausible. And then you're looking for probable. What have you done that can allow me to put some meat on your story? Possible, plausible, probable. I've struggled with ways of explaining the contrast between the three words. And I always, you know, I tried different things. But two years ago, I was in Latin America. And I, 
think I found something that at least works in Latin America. So I had a three, three city tour. I started Sao Paulo in day one, Santiago, Chile in day two, and uh, Lima, Peru in day three. So I said, I want, and I was doing the session on stories to numbers. So I said, what can I ask uh, an audience of 300 Brazilians? where everybody in the room is kind of an opinion on the topic. What topic do you take that every Brazilian in the room will have an opinion on? It's soccer. Everything else, you know, you, it's mixed. So here's how I started, October of 2017. Here's the question I started with. Is it possible that Brazil will win the World Cup? What do you think the answer to that was? You ask 300 Brazilians, is it possible Brazil in the World Cup nine months before the World Cup? They say, of course, we won it five times. Yes, that was easy. Then I said, is it plausible that Brazil will win the World Cup? And in October of 2017, they felt pretty good about themselves. But if I'd asked that question in January 2015, it would have been a little shaky, right? After they got beaten up by Germany 7-2, they weren't feeling that good about themselves. But by October, they'd made the recovery. They said, yes, it's plausible. Then I said, is it probable that Brazil will win the World Cup? And now you could see the wheels starting to kind of mesh. If Neymar stays healthy and doesn't flop and flip and flop and flip and flop and flip or whatever he does, and this happens and this happens, yes. Each step, you have to go through more rigor. That's why I think about business stories. I said, this worked really well in Brazil. I should do it in Santiago tomorrow. I should have done my homework, but I did not. I show up in Santiago. 100 Chileans in the room, I ask, is it possible that Chile will win the World Cup? Grown men in the audience start crying. <laughs> I said, what the hell happened here? Why are you crying? It turned out that the week before I showed up, they'd lost 2-1 to, I don't know, Honduras or Argentina or somebody and been knocked out of World Cup contention. I didn't have the heart, heart to ask after that, is it plausible, is it probable? <laughs> because I think one of the conditions for winning the World Cup is you actually have to be there. <laughs> possible, plausible. Is it possible the Yankees will win the World Series this year? Yes. In fact, the great, day, great thing about opening day is any team can win the World Series. It's 0-0, all tied for the top of the division. Ten games in, the Mets are out, so you can say it's impossible right there, right? <laughs> but I think it's possible. Is it plausible? Can, I can see how. Is it probable? I'm already looking at my starting pitching and saying, you know what, I've got a 39-year-old who has a bad knee. I've got you know, a young pitcher who might turn into mush. By into mush. And I start working out the pieces. You can see with each step. So pick your favorite sport and your favorite team. Take it through this test. And you will see the contrast between possible, plausible, probable. So with Uber, before I go to Uber, let me give you examples of impossible, implausible, and improbable stories. You know what a fairness opinion is? What is a fairness opinion? It's a fig leaf that acquiring companies get as protection against getting sued. Because 32 years ago, the Delaware courts did something really stupid. They said, if you do an acquisition, and you want to protect yourself against lawsuits, you need to get an independent third party to come in and sign off on this document called a fairness opinion that says this was a fair deal, you can't sue these guys. You think that sounds good? In every acquisition then, here's what happens. The acquiring company hires an independent third party, which is basically means not your investment bank, some other investment bank. The investment bank comes in and looks at the numbers and says this deal looks fair. And the reason I'm so incredibly cynical about this is there's never been a deal in history that's been stopped because you could not get a fairness opinion. The worst deal of the world. There's a fairness opinion, the Time Warner AOL deal. There's somebody who says, that looks fair to me. So this was about three years ago when Tesla bought SolarCity, an incredibly conflicted deal. Think of why. Who's the largest shareholder in Tesla? Elon Musk. Who's the largest shareholder in SolarCity? Elon Musk. Who's the CEO of Tesla? Elon Musk, who's the CEO of Solar City? Another guy called Musk, but his cousin, you know. So when Tesla bought Solar City, they knew they were going to get sued right and left. So they had to buy protection, very expensive. And that's the other thing. The more you pay for the protection, the more the Delaware court seem to think that the protection is actually protection. So you can't go cheap. 
So Tesla hires a boutique investment bank. What's a boutique investment bank? It's like a gastropub. <laughs> Yesterday I walked in the airport, I walked by a gastropub. I avoid those places like the plague because you know what a gastropub is, right? You go order a burger, it costs you $25. That's what the gastro allows you to do, double the price of everything. A boutique investment bank does regular investment banking stuff, it charges twice the price. So they hire Evercore. I'm going to say something incredibly mean about Evercore here. But I could say this about pretty much any investment bank. So don't take it personally. Or take it personally. I really don't care, right? It's, yeah. They hire Evercore. So Tesla hires Evercore. And Solar City hires Lazard. Two big names to come in. And this is actually quite a challenge because you got two investment banks and they both have to tell the shareholders of the two companies that the deal they're getting is fair, right? That's kind of a tricky balance. But usually you create synergy and other stuff to make up and then you divvy it up. So I'm expecting every rule to be broken in fairness. So I cut investment banks a lot of slack on fairness opinions. So I'm taking a look at Evercore's valuation of Tesla. It's a discounted cash flow valuation, at least in name. Now what do you need for a discounted cash flow valuation? You need cash flows and a discount rate, right? So I said, where did they get the cash flows? And they were very open about it. Now Evercore said they got the cash flows from the Tesla board of directors. How this is fair or an opinion, I don't know. So where did the Tesla board of directors get it from? They got it from Goldman Sachs Equity Research. What a tangled web we weave. You say, what's Goldman Sachs got to do with? Goldman Sachs was Tesla's native investment bank. They said, you want numbers. We have somebody who can supply you numbers. Our equity research analyst has numbers for you. Let's give it to the board. The board gives it to Evercore. Evercore puts it into a spreadsheet. Now, how this is evaluation, you've, you're like, like a concierge. You're collecting cash flows from the Tesla board. They did some little gymnastics with the discount rate to show that they had a beta and they talked about Bloomberg betas and you know, all this stuff and they plugged things in. Every single number you could have taken issue with, but as I said, I was willing to cut slack. But at the end of the five years, the cash flows ended. Why? Because they were given only five years. So guess what they did at the end of year five? What do we do in DCF when we run out of cash flows? We assume a growth rate forever. Okay, so far I can live with this. They're following a textbook. It might even be mine, for all I know. <laughs> so I look at what growth rate they're assuming after year five. And they're assuming a 6% growth rate forever. My first reaction was, what currency are you guys valuing the company in? Pesos, maybe, and you forgot to tell me? <laughs> it turned out to be US dollars. What will happen to Tesla if it grows at 6% a year forever? In about 30 years, it's going to be the US economy. In about 50 years, it'll be the global economy. I can't even visualize a global economy that's all Tesla <laughs> all the time. You'd have to live in your Tesla. You'd have to eat your Tesla. You've got entertainment. I know Elon Musk is a really smart guy with a dog mode on the car. Have you heard of the dog mode? No, you should read about it when you get a chance. But I don't think that, but even if you bought into that, you're that much of a believer, thought, what happens after 50 years? The only thing I could do to make this make sense is to bring SpaceX into the equation. You see where my mind is going, right? You put your Teslas on spaceships and you launch them off and sell them to the Martians. This is an impossible valuation. There's no dancing around. And for this incredible job, guess how much Evercore got paid? Nine and a half million dollars. There is no justice in this world. If that valuation had been turned to this Friday to me, I wouldn't even have wasted 15 seconds looking at it before sending it back saying, this is not even worthy of being called a valuation. And I'm not mailing you a check for nine and a half million dollars with it if you send it to me, right? That's an impossible valuation. Here's a second example. I mean, this is my 54th semester teaching this class. And we go through this mid-semester exercise of DCF feedback every single year. So about four years ago, somebody values Netflix. Fascinating, fun, dynamic company to value. Anybody valuing Netflix here? Yeah. Have you got a value yet? OK. When you get a value, you're going to find this. It's really, really, really difficult to get a value higher than the price because it's so richly priced. People are so optimistic about it. This guy got a value four times higher than the price. I decided to take a look at what he was assuming. So I look at his revenues, and he's projecting revenues of $600 billion <laughs> in year 10 for Netflix. So I call him in, and I say, I notice your revenues in year 10. Do you have Netflix? He said, yes. I said, how much do you pay per year? 
put out his calculator, it seemed to be attached to his refrigerator, about $100 here. I said, how many customers or subscribers would you need to get $600 billion revenue? He put out his calculator. He said, you don't need a damn calculator. <laughs> $600 billion divided by 100 is 6 million customers. He said, I don't see where this questioning is going. I said, hang in there. I have a couple more questions, and I'll let you go. <laughs> I said, what's the population of the world? He said, I don't know. I have to go check Wikipedia. I'll save you the trouble. It's about 7 billion. He said, is there something you're not telling me? Maybe there's a law that's been passed that I don't know about that says every man, woman, and child and pet has to have their own Netflix. No sharing allowed. <laughs> he said, don't be absurd. And I said, I'm not the one who estimated 600 billion revenues. You did. He said, I was just using last year's numbers. I said, what? He said, I took last year's growth in subscribers, and I used it as my growth rate for the next 10 years. Be very careful. Excel and compounding can do some amazing things to companies, right? So my suggestion is when you value a company, take a look at your dollar revenues in year 10, because it's so easy to get caught up with that growth rate. It doesn't look that bad. I'll take 15, make it 18. You'd be amazed at how much effect it has in your year 10 numbers. Impossible valuation. <laughs> Implausible valuations can happen, but you really have to have a really good reason. I'll give you an example. Usually when companies uh, have high margins, competition comes in. So a couple of years ago, I was in the Middle East, and I was in uh, Dubai, valuing a company called Almarai. It's a Saudi Arabian food processing company with profit margins of 18%. All other Middle Eastern food, food processing companies have margins of like 6 7 8%. So I was puzzled. Well, how come there's more competition not coming into the space? So I remember throwing this question out to a group of Middle Eastern analysts, and one of them said, have you taken a look at who owns Almarai, who the shareholders are. And I said, I haven't, I should. And I took a look, and he looked at that list from Bloomberg and the top 17 investors. The top of the list was somebody, somebody bin Saud, part of the Saudi royal family. There's your competitive advantage. Member of the royal family standing at the bottom saying, you can't come in. This is my company's country. That doesn't even make sense. But essentially, you got protection from competition. But I could see then why the margin stayed high. Another example, student of this class actually from 10, 12 years ago. I ended up working for the NFL. Sounds like a much more fun job than working, going to work for Goldman Sachs, right? So he actually sent me a valuation of an NFL team. And he said, can you take a look and tell me whether this looks OK? So I looked and the assumptions were reasonable, except for the fact this was a team that owned their own stadium, and they were putting nothing back into the stadium. And I emailed him back saying, shouldn't you be investing in the stadium? He said, that's easy to explain. Every time we need our stadium spruced up, here's what we do. We go to the city and we threaten them. <laughs> With what? We're moving. And they fix the stadium for us. I said, OK. Plausible, when I push, if you can give me a good reason back, that's what you're going to get. Let's close with one final thing, because I'm going to give you some insight on exactly what I'm going to do this Friday when you turn in your DCFs. I know you're expecting miracles. Like you're expecting me to look at your growth rate of 21%, that should really be 19%. No, that's not happening. I don't know the growth rate for every company. Here's what I'm looking for. I'm going to look at your growth rate. What are the three possibilities? High growth, low growth, no or negative growth, right? It's your company, so if you pick high growth, I'm going to say, okay. Then I'm going to look at the difference between your after-tax operating income and your free cash flow to the firm. I know there are lots of items in between. You have acquisitions, capex, et cetera. But I'm going to, what does that difference tell me? How much you're reinvesting back. And what are the three possibilities? High reinvestment, low reinvestment, no reinvestment. Then I'm going to look at your cost of capital. I'm not going to spend my time on your beta. Your, I'm not going down the maze with you. But I'm going to look at your overall cost of capital. If it's in dollar terms, it's easy. But if it's not, I have to do some conversion. I'm going to look at your dollar. And if you have a 15 and right there again, you can have a high, medium, or low. And I can measure that because I know the median cost of capital of a company is about 9%. I know I'm running over. But if I see high growth, in your valuation. What should I expect to see in the reinvestment? High reinvestment or low reinvestment? High, and usually your cost of capital should be higher than average. High, high, high. Makes sense, low, low. So if you send me high, low, low, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. I'm going to send you back a message saying, I noticed you're using a 30% growth rate, but you don't seem to be reinvesting very much, and you don't s your cost of capital looks really low. Tell me why. And you might have a really good story explaining it. He's saying, I don't need you to do that. I can do it myself. You're right. You can do it yourself. In fact, why don't you do it yourself, actually, and then send it to me? Because then you're going to be able to tell me the story before 
I ask you, because that's really all I can do in valuation is check for consistency. So when we come back, I'm going to finish the storytelling part, and we're we actually have valued a single company, so we're actually going to value companies on one side. Oh, really? Okay, I see. Yeah. 